Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And I've just had a wonderful conversation with my friend Bobby Conway, who is coming out this week with a new book called Does Christianity Still Make Sense? A Former Skeptic Responds to Today's Toughest toughest Objections to Christianity. And I am very excited about this. I haven't had the chance to read the book myself yet, but I know Bobby really well, and I've talked with him on the podcast before at length about his story of growing up not in the Christian world at all and um, becoming a Christian through the ministry of Greg Glory, becoming a pastor, but then going through some really significant doubt. Um, And so he writes about that. This is sort of his his autobiography, an intellectual autobiography, I think is what he called it. But we talked through a little bit about his story. We talked through a lot of the things that we're seeing in church culture right now, like a lot of the scandals, the moral failings, um, the hypocrisy. We talked a bit about um, the rise of the nuns, which are people who don't identify with any particular spiritual um, identity, but yet still kind of hold some kind of vague spirituality and and how we can reach that group. I think that um, Bobby is a pastor who has got a pastor's heart, especially toward people who struggle with doubts, and he's got some great advice for churches and for pastors about how to engage people who are going through doubts and who might even have questions, because as Bobby points out in today's episode, which is a highlight for me, there's a difference between a question and a doubt, and there's a lot more of an emotional component to a doubt. So I really hope you get a lot out of this conversation. And so here is Dr. Bobby Conway. Well, Bobby, always great to have you on the show. I loved uh, when we got to sit down at Cross-Examined Instructor Academy, I guess a couple of years ago now, and uh, we talked through a good bit of your story. And I'm so excited to hear that your book is finally coming out because I think back then you you were maybe in the process of writing the book and it was a long way off, but it's it's coming soon. So for anyone who may <laughs> maybe had missed that episode or, or isn't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I'd also love for you to give us like a thumbnail sketch of your story, because I know we I, I do want to recommend to everybody who's watching and listening to go back into the archives and listen to that episode where Bobby goes really deep into the ins and outs of his story of walking through doubt and um, addiction, all sorts of different things. Uh, but give us a thumbnail sketch of that just as we start so we have context for who you are and uh, then we'll get into this this awesome book that's coming out. Yeah, you bet. And thank you for having me on. And it's good to be with you again on your thriving program. <laughs> I'll say uh, what happened in my life uh, was totally unexpected. Uh, to think that I would end up being in gospel ministry, uh, I would have just laughed hysterically. I grew up in California, never heard the gospel till I was 19. And a teammate that I played baseball with took me in college to hear Greg Laurie. And I just resonated with him because the very few times I went to church, uh, I didn't understand what was going on. It was very confusing. And I just found myself like a fish out of water. But I was struggling because I had collected a lot of guilt through uh, just living promiscuous, uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, stealing, lying. I mean, you just name it. I mean, cheating. Uh, I was a scrub brush. I mean, I just, I I didn't have a good value system. Uh, I was going to high school in Northern California, about an hour South of San Francisco. I also spent a lot of my uh, growing up in Southern California, but at this time, after leaving Northern California, it was really dark up there. There was not a lot of talk about Jesus. And I went down to Southern California uh, and then there I'm back where I spent some of my early years growing up and man, all of a sudden I just felt like I was bumping into Jesus people everywhere. Uh, you know, there was a big presence of this and I found myself really drawn to uh, this pastor, Greg Glory, because he gave me the answer to two questions I was looking for. What do I do with my guilt and what's the purpose of my life? And I found that Jesus eradicated my guilt on the cross through placing my faith and trust in him and that he came to give us life and life abundantly. And it wasn't just this easy, you know, beginning journey for me. I struggled for about a year and a half with several relapses of, you know, Hey, I'm going to quit on this day. God, I'm going to quit on this date. I'm going to stop here. And it just didn't work yet. And then finally, uh, you know, I go into recovery and I would do over 400 meetings in one year of sobriety. And at that point, I just came alive for, for, for the Lord. And I was totally uneducated. Uh, I couldn't even pass tests to get in the military, cheated my way through school. And uh, 
I fell in love with learning and reading because it was my way to get to know this God who saved me. And so I started reading and studying and consuming. But what I ended up doing is I threw my addiction without even seeing it into studying. And that mm. would send me on an obsessive journey where, you know, I would go and get my bachelor's degree and then go do a four year master's degree and then go get two doctorates degree. Well, somewhere along the line, uh, I was so locked in that I was doubting this wonderful Christian faith that uh, that I believed in that transformed my life. And that's what led me to end up writing. Does Christianity still make sense? Because. I thought I might be an apostate as I was inching up against the edge of leaving it all as I was racked by doubts. Hmm. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing, you know, we call it deconstruction, but really in so many cases, what it is, is, is apostasy. And apostasy is, my best understanding of the word is somebody who has professed faith in Christ and then walks away from that. And you call yourself a near apostate at certain times, which is why I think your story is so intriguing. And especially this book is so interesting. I haven't had the chance to read it yet. I look forward to reading it. But, you know, I think we're living in a time where we're seeing this sort of mass exodus, this deconstruction happen, um, and a lot of that ending up in apostasy. And I think there are a lot of books that are po apologists are writing to the people who are deconstructing, saying basically things like, here are some intellectual reasons to not leave the faith, right? Here's X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. is why Christianity is true. Yeah. And then you have other people sort of like, my book is more for the church to understand deconstruction. But I, I think that from from what I'm reading about your book, it's, it's kind of hitting the bullseye of talking to the person who's experiencing those doubts, honest doubts, who might be a near apostate like you were. Um, but it's not just the intellectual reasons. Of course, that's all interspersed, I'm sure, knowing you. But there's there's a real emotional component to it as well. And, and a lot of that involves your story. Um, I remember hearing you talk several years ago, Bobby, about when you were working on one of your PhDs, you were reading a lot of Nietzsche and and some of this like dark, more dark philosophical stuff. What What effect did that have on your soul as you were already, you know, you're a Christian and you've maybe at this point struggled with some doubts. Like what effect did, did some reading some of that stuff have on your faith? Well, at certain points, um, some stuff would be disruptive uh, to me in different ways. So I guess the journey would look like this. I, I went to Bible college to understand the Bible. Then I went and got a master's of theology because I felt like I needed theology to you know, to understand the Bible. And then I did an apologetics degree because that would help me with my theology. And then, you know, the philosophy would help me with my apologetics and deep out in the waters of uh, the philosophical waters, I found myself just thinking, how, you know, how can I really know this? And one of the things that I was after, which I knew intellectually that it was unachievable, but for some reason, I was struggling with how can I really have assurance if I can't have certainty? Hmm. Because if I can't have certainty, then how can I really know? And so how can I find this sense of assurance that I'm longing for? I, and I can remember going to bed with just fears overwhelming me. Like, you know, in my brain, I mean, I'm the guy that I'll sit outside sometimes and I'll, you know, I'll envision my brain or something on a out in the grass in front of me. And I'll go, there's a three and a half pound of mass. And that's what I got to work with to figure out the cosmos above me. And then I'll go, okay, I'm okay. Because, you know, my brain is, is not my mind. And then I resolve the tension that I'm feeling. Uh, but there, there are things that I, I can remember laying in bed going, you know, I'm going at rapid speeds on a chunk of dirt. And I just need to know that I'm sustained, mm -hmm. that someone holds all this together and my my sense of of scare was overwhelming um and i think some of that has to do with just you know there's there's the intellectual doubts then there's the guy that's prone to anxiety and always was and that was part of why i turned to addiction uh, to assuage the, the inner angst so i'm a, you know i've always been a little bit of a tortured soul i guess you could say mm -hmm. Um, and, and the, the creative side and, and, and it's, that can be a tormenting, uh, to an individual, but I do feel like the thought that troubled me was I committed to the Christian faith at a young age 
And I did so without studying all the different worldviews. So how can I be sure I gave myself to the right worldview? Like, what if I would have went to another setting and I would have heard a solution to my guilt and purpose? Would I have given my life to that? Hmm. And so I didn't have the kind of assurance that I wanted. And so that made me obsessive in search of answers. Um, but what I didn't realize is how much God can use doubt and even a level of deconstructing to become the making of an apologist. Because I would find myself having to think to walk away from Christianity is only to walk into another worldview where I'll inherit another set of unforeseen doubts. So I would try to envision what would be my existential angst if I was a Buddhist or if I gave myself the new age or atheism. Uh, and, and I would just think about all of this. And then when God would bring me out, it was like an amazing gift that my thorn became. And it was the rose that offered color mm. to how beautiful our worldview is in comparison to all the other worldview options that are out there. Well, that's interesting that you you said something that kind of perked my interest. You said that a little bit of deconstructing can be good if it leads to a good place. And I'm curious to know your definition of deconstruction, because as you may or may not know, in our book, uh, Tim and I define it as a postmodern process of rethinking your theological beliefs, but not regarding scripture as a standard. And we realize not everybody defines it that way. That's the definition we put forth and defend. Um, and I'm sure that's not what you mean when you say a, a little bit could be good. So talk a a little bit more about that. Like, what do you mean when you say deconstruction? Just so that nobody's confused about what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think for me, um, the, the way that the, that I'm using the term, and, and I know there is a debate on that, and I'm I'm very open to you know being a little bit more formal and even the usage of the term. Uh, but I did feel like in the middle of it. I was rethinking through so much of my experience. It's like Francis Schaeffer, uh, the Christian apologist who died in 1984. He told his wife, Edith, I have to go back and rethink my entire Christian faith. And I think what he was experiencing was just, you know, this angst. He was wondering if he got it right. And so he found himself fine tuning some of his thinking and so for me, deconstructing is not me using the term like Jacques Derrida or right. thinking in terms of uh, post-modernity um, or, you know, Michel Foucault, uh, or Leotard, any of these type of thinkers. It's much more of just, hey, I was constructing a faith as a Christian uh, and I was wondering if I was in the right house. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the, some of the walls started coming down, but because of the confusion uh, in postmodernity and with deconstruction as a very, you know, big term, especially uh, you see deconstruction happening all over the place uh, in our world, it's probably not the best term uh, for me to even use as a Christian. But for the sake of the emotional experience, your your world just feels like it's coming mm. apart and you feel really undone and insecure uh, in, in a time of existential angst and going through a dark night of the soul. Yeah, that's helpful. That, it's always helpful to define terms and um, yeah, that, that's really helpful. In your book, you take on a lot of really kind of explosive topics, I would say. They're talking about church scandals, the hypocrisy that a lot of people see among the leaders of, the, of churches, people using God's name to oppress others, things like racism, why does God allow evil? Um, I wonder, you know, of all of these I don't know if you would call them triggers or things that could, could propel someone into a crisis of faith. What do you think is the most, or if there is one that you would say is probably the most relevant one for right now, what would you say it is?
All right, we're pausing for just a moment to let you know about our first sponsor for today, which is Foundation Worldview Curriculum. Foundation Worldview creates a curriculum series that will empower your child to think biblically in a very deceptive and chaotic world. So they have easy to use video-based lessons and therefore ages four to up till about 12. And they're designed to equip your child with biblical literacy and critical thinking skills. And so current curriculum series include a biblical worldview, comparative worldview, and careful thinking. And there's actually some more even on top of those, but the comparative worldview is the curriculum we took our son through last year in his homeschool, and it was so wonderful. He learned how to identify what the definition of truth is. You ask him today, what is truth? And he will say, truth is what is real. What is the source of truth? God is the source of truth. And he also learned to identify and compare the beliefs of other religions with the the beliefs of Christians. It was such an absolutely wonderful curriculum series. I also love that there's scripture memorization that they go through as well. So if you pick up one of these licenses, you'll walk your child through through these lessons, and that will open the door to really important and good theological conversations. Go to foundationworldview.com and use my code ALISA to get 10% off of a family license. So that's foundationworldview.com. Use my code ALISA. I think um, it would be tough to put any one point on this uh, because I can envision different situations. But I do think that there are some themes uh, that we can see. And let's just say that um, the, the form of deconstruction in my own experience that I would that I would be referring to it would be doubt that's doing something about considering the questions that are haunting the person. Mm. And therefore, sometimes when you do something about it, you you modify, you change, you you alter some positions that you once had. And I think what can happen for some people is they can be put in too tight of a denominational doctrinal box. And they're only told, you know, a handful of viewpoints. And they're not led to understand that there are others that are part of the Christian faith that hold to this. So, for example, I was talking to a caller on Pastor's Perspective, a national syndicated radio show to call in, uh, where I answer questions with my teammate, Brian Broderson. And the caller said, hey, I'd never even heard there were other options as it relates to the tribulation, I was always, you know, a pre-trib and that's all I ever heard. And then she heard me talking about leaning toward being a post-trib and she wanted to know more about that. And I said, I think it's ethically imperative that pastors, they don't just teach their own one way of everything, but they're honest about other views because if you have an analytical thinker, that it that that thinks outside the box well they might buy into your viewpoint at your membership class but then as they start to grow and they go down the road and then they start coming across alternative positions that blow up some of the positions that were given to them then they start to struggle with doubts and that's what happened to me so i think we need to figure out a way to rethink discipleship for the emerging generation that instead of thinking for them, we teach them how to think. We let them know the different views that are out there. And what I told my kids, I was like, look, I want you to love God, love people, celebrate the gospel. That's great commandment and great commission, living, and then enjoy learning. Don't try to conquer it. Know that there's lots of viewpoints that are out there. Take your time feeling those viewpoints out and don't commit too quickly because if you do, you'll read something down the road that will blow up the committed view that you had prematurely and you can start to doubt. Well, this was some of the stuff that was happening to me. And I think this happens to a lot of people, especially in these more legalistic denominations. So that's one thing that I would share. And we could talk about others, of course. Yeah, no, that's a really good one because in, of course, doing research for our book, we had to listen to countless deconstruction stories and just kind of live in that hashtag in that world for a year. 
or more actually that more than that. But um, one that is something I really observed in a lot of there's like common threads. Every deconstruction story is different, but there are common threads that you can find uh, that seem to be quite mm. common among the deconstruction stories. And one of those was just what you've described, where maybe they grew up in a particular denomination, and you know you mentioned eschatology. That's a big one. Maybe it's the age of the earth. Maybe they were taught that there's this one specific view of the age of the earth and everything else is liberal or, or apostate or something. And then they find out, oh, wait, there are Christians who actually believe this or something a little bit slightly different than that. And it blows up their their worldview because they so conflated maybe what would be a secondary issue with the actual gospel. Now, secondary issues can mm-hmm. touch on gospel and you got to think through all that stuff through. But I, I was also reading, I was just looking up the book so I could make sure I get the name right. And I can't, I didn't have time to look it up, but it's um, Marsden, I believe is his name, the historian who wrote about the uh, fundamentalist mm-hmm. modernist split, right? And um, although, you know, I get, I, I, I'm sympathetic to a lot of the more conservative side of that, of course, because I think we're seeing a repeat of that with progressive Christianity. Um, but one of the things where it seems like they they made eschatology a primary, the premillennial view became like primary alongside the gospel. And I think that potentially has set up some people now today to think that one very specific view of eschatology is the only, you know, one that is an acceptable view for a Christian. And, you know, of course, as people who believe in objective truth, we know there is only one correct one, but there are different views because people are trying to get to what that is. And and it's not yes. easy. I mean, anybody who does a deep dive into eschatology, I think will come out a lot more humble <laughs> about their view as I did, <laughs> certainly, because I kind of grew up that way. You know, Carrie Chapel Roots, it was like pre-mill was the view. Um, and I still, you know, have a hunch that may be right. But, um, yeah, when we conflate a lot of these things that that you can be a Christian and have a different view than pre millennialism is the point. And I think when people Mm. don't realize that, then they have to not only wrestle with what are these other views, but then they have to wrestle with, well, what is what is primary? Because they weren't really taught that either. And so I think that's that's a really good observation you've made about that. Um, What you know, you you talk a lot about mental health and the role Mm -hmm. that that plays with maybe going through certain kinds of doubts. And I've thought a lot about this, too, because even just thinking about it from a personality perspective, Because I remember way back over 10 years ago being in the church that I wrote another gospel about that ended up going progressive and and all of the discussions were leaning toward progressivism. And I remember even wondering back then, like, is this even just a personality thing? Because I am so bent toward truth and wanting to know what's objectively true, whereas it seemed like that was considered immature or unenlightened or... Um, and it was just even a personality trait or, or a mental, you know, a state of your mind. Talk about mental health and what you think, how that all relates with doubt and, and walking through these dark times. Jumping back in here for a moment to let you know about our next sponsor, which is Good Ranchers American Meat Delivered. And this is what I love about Good Ranchers is that every single month I have the absolute highest quality grass-fed beef, better than organic chicken, delivered right to my door, frozen, ready to be put in the freezer. And that way I can pull it out whenever I want to make something for my family. It makes it so easy. I don't have to think too hard about what I'm going to make. And it's the quality that I'm looking for in my grocery store that very often I can't find. In fact, many people are unaware that the vast majority of meat that you buy in the grocery store, even the grass-fed beef, is imported from overseas, from countries that may not have the highest level of transparency, may not have the highest quality standards. But with Good Ranchers, you're going to get no antibiotics, nor ho- no hormones ever, grass-fed beef, better than organic chicken, heritage breed pork, wild-caught seafood delivered right to your door. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but a couple of years ago, prices on meat skyrocketed, and they might be heading toward another spike in the market. And this is why I love what they're offering from Good Ranchers this month in the month of April, is they're going to give you their price lock guarantee. That means if you subscribe in the month of April, your price is guaranteed to not go up until 2026. So you get to lock in that price, plus you're going to get 10% off of your subscription and free express shipping. You can't beat that. So go to goodranchers.com, use my code ALISA for 10% off, plus that price lock guarantee and free express shipping. Again, that's goodranchers.com, use my code ALISA.
you know, it's interesting. I mean, you, you take, for example, how one's personality makeup can impact them with doubt. So if you have a people pleaser uh, that struggles pleasing people, and then you're living in a culture where we're supposed to be tolerant of others, well, how many people pleasers are out there? And they're moving toward progressive Christianity in the name of people pleasing. Yeah. And so th that can be a, a, you know, a temperament that somebody has uh, when it comes to uh, people with anxiety and fear. Uh, one of the things that they want is they want this sense of certainty that everything's going to be okay. And, um, you know, people that struggle with anxiety in a, in a, in a deep kind of way, I mean, they contribute to world worry on a daily basis. Uh, you know, in fact, I would worry so much in my life, Elisa, that if I wasn't worry, worried, I would begin to worry that I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you got a problem on your hand when that starts. Yeah, happening, right. right. So, uh, you know, I, I've joked at times, you can call me, you know, Pastor Panic or the Panic Pastor, um, <laughs> you know, and I'm using a little bit of hyperbole, but it, it, this inner uh, turbulence can, can create anxiety in people. And then they start to struggle um, with trying to assuage that. Um, and that can go to dangerous places. But I think the temperament that, that I identified in my previous book, Doubting Toward Faith, um, that certainly is how I'm wired, but I think I've noticed this in other doubters as well. There's a ter type of doubter that can get stuck and I call him or her the obsessive analyzer. Mm. So you can have somebody that's obsessive but they might not be obsessing on doubts. They could be obsessing on, you know, Wonder Bread or mm -hmm. on Netflix. Uh, but then you can have somebody that's an analyzer, but they don't obsess so they can unlock. So I think of somebody like a William Lane Craig, highly analytical, uh, clear thinker. Uh, and I think that he's able to just you know, unlock at the end of the day, he puts systems in place and he'll check his emails at board. You know, he's, he's got his processes in place and, and he's wonderful at what he does. But then there's the person that is both an obsessor or, and, and that's kind of your attic brain coupled with a highly analytical person. And you can get lost so much in the weeds that you can't unlock in your constant. It's like the person that, uh, always keeps going downstairs to make sure that the stove's turned off. Well, he or she knows that the stove's turned off, but you keep doing the same thing over and over again. And the person that's an obsessive analyzer can get really stuck. And then if you stay stuck long enough, because the doubt means to be in two minds and you can't live in two minds for long, eventually you'll have to make a decision. Hmm. But if you're, in two minds and it splits the mind, now you're going to get secondary emotional issues because the mental torture of not being able to be settled about your belief, if your belief matters to you, if it's an intimate belief, now you will go from obsessive analyzing to a sense of anxiety about the whole deal to feeling like a sham because you have questions, mm. to wondering if you're secure enough to really be able to open up with others, to feeling like you're, you've been abandoned or God forsaken, uh, to feeling fearful about your future. And it can lead then to depression, angst. And it took me to the place, I mean, I, I mean, suicidal ideation, I ended up in counseling, on antidepressants. So when I talk about this, this is like very, it, this was, this was a man that my wife and kids saw is totally sold out to Jesus that for several years, they started to just see a blankness in me and sitting out on a porch at night, trying to figure life out. And I'm just an emptiness mm. in a hollowness to me but the search was real, but I, and I was reading literally hundreds and hundreds of books. I became so obsessed that I learned to triple speed audible books. Um, I mean, I, 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 I obsessing, I mean, I did a sabbatical for 90 days. I, I, I went through over a hundred books, wow. um, many classics and, but for every book that I would read to chase down a set of doubts, 
I would collect another dozen or 20 doubts. So the snowball got so big that it was crushing me. And I've, it's like the myth of Sisyphus where he's trying to push that gigantic boulder up. I, I'd have these flickers of hope where I think oh, I'm going to get this boulder of doubt off of me. And then another challenge would come and then I'd roll back down to the bottom. And it was that process started to bringing me to the end of myself. I was mm. absolutely gutted by it. Mm. All right, we're hitting the pause button one more time to tell you about our next sponsor, which is Seven Weeks Coffee. If you've watched this podcast for any amount of time, you know how much I love Seven Weeks Coffee. I just had a lovely espresso this morning. In fact, I get my espresso beans from Seven Weeks Coffee every single month because I love the quality. I love that it's shade-grown, mold-free, pesticide-free. I love that it's low acid, and it just tastes so good. This is the absolute highest quality coffee you can get. I also love the ethics of seven weeks coffee. They are direct trade, which is more ethical than even fair trade. In fact, they pay their farmers 300% more than the standards for fair trade actually require, but that's not everything. I love seven weeks coffee because they're Christians who are unapologetically pro-life. In fact, that's what their name is all about. Did you know that at seven weeks, the baby in the womb is about the size of a coffee bean, and that's when you can first detect the heartbeat. And I love the passion behind seven weeks coffee because they also give 10% of their profits to pro-life resource pregnancy centers all over the country. They've given away over $300,000 to date. And I just love knowing that when I order from Seven Weeks Coffee, not only am I getting the highest quality coffee possible, but I'm also supporting the pro-life cause. It's a no-brainer. And I love that you can choose an option where you can, if you just want to buy one pound or two pounds or three pounds of gifts for people, maybe for Mother's Day or for other things coming up, maybe a host gift if you're invited to someone's house, but you can also subscribe and become a member of the Heartbeat Club, which is where I get my espresso beans every month. I'm a member of the Heartbeat Club there. So if you want to check it out, go to sevenweekscoffee.com. You can use my code Alisa for 10% off. Again, that's sevenweekscoffee.com. Use my code Alisa. You know, a lot of people listening to this have friends and loved ones who are in a process that sounds a lot like what you've just described you walked through. So I think you're uniquely positioned to answer the question that is asked to me night after night when I go and speak in um, churches about things like deconstruction and doubt and progressive Christianity and all the things. Inevitably, I will have at least one older couple come up to me and say, you know, my adult child is in deconstruction. How, how do we respond to them? How do we navigate that relationship? Because in some cases, it sounds like, you know, in your case, you weren't necessarily shutting your family and friends out. In some cases, people are because they've already decided their beliefs are toxic or harmful. But the question that they always ask is, how do I navigate this relationship? How do I keep my child in my life? So... I'd love to ask you in those darkest moments when that snowball, you know, when that when that boulder is about to crush you, uh, how are you hoping the Christians in your life will respond to you? How how, you know, maybe was there someone in your life that responded really well or maybe somebody who can remain nameless who didn't respond the best? And, you know, how did those um, Christians in your life help you or hurt you in that in that experience that you were going through? You know, I've shared with you before uh, uh, about having a relapse with alcohol after 23 years of sobriety and some of the pain and that my family went through uh, with the church leadership. Um, you know, I chose to resign. I could have stayed put, uh, but we just didn't feel really loved well in it. It was kind of like looking at, at, at the relapse instead of like, well, what led to that? What was going on? Uh, you know, we're... What because you, mindset? I want to say this for the people who didn't hear the first time, you immediately confessed to your elder board yeah. that you had relapsed. Yeah. 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 I mean, it might've been a within four or five days or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I did, I went, I talked and, and it was just, it was, it was very disappointing because I, for me, I couldn't imagine. I mean, if somebody had a relapse, first off, I just say, man, you know, that's amazing that God, Gave you 23 years without a drink. That's something. Let's let's remember what he did and he can do it again. Yeah. And then let's talk about what made you turn that way. 
you know. Um, and, you know, it's been said before, if you got a bottle in one hand and a gun in the other, take the drink. And there's some people that get to a place that, for me, when that happened, um, yeah, I hate to say it, but Jesus wasn't enough in that mm-hmm. moment from where I felt because I had wanted some kind of a relief to the torture that I felt on my inside. And sometimes the Lord lets us sit in that mm-hmm. and he doesn't come to our rescue enough. Now he is enough, but yeah. it didn't feel like it in the moment. Now I didn't have a gun in one hand and, and a bottle in the other. Uh, but it's a, the, the point is, is sometimes people get to that kind of a place and, you know, take the drink if that's where you are. Uh, but hopefully we can help you see that Jesus is enough. Now, as it relates to the, my doubts and how that was handled, uh, I think that they did a great job, the people that were in my life at the church when I was going through that. Uh, that's where I would say I felt like there was space to talk um, with them, and I really appreciate that. And so I feel like in the name of just being objective, you know, you have one season, which is tough, and another season, but, um, you know, I think that my wife and my kids, they didn't really know what to do. And it was very lonely, to be honest with you, with my wife, my kids, and even with church leadership. And that's uh, partly because I feel like I was thinking at a level that that they're not even really thinking about. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but it would be unfair to fasten my doubts to them Hmm. because I don't think that they would have been equipped to handle that. Uh, and so that was painful too, because I didn't. And then when I did share my doubts, I found myself feeling worried that, that, that my doubts might be contagious. Yeah. So like progressive Christians, I think that they want their stuff to be contagious. Yeah. They're like in a lot of them to say, join party of just, you know, getting, I, I was scared to death of leading anybody astray. Yeah. I, I, and I didn't what I was experiencing upon anybody. So that made it all the more lonely. Mm. I so relate with that because when I was going through my um, pretty significant period of doubt myself, I, it was the same way. I think there were people who were surprised when I finally told the story because they're like, wait, I knew you during that time, but I didn't talk to people really about it because for the same reasons you mentioned, I didn't want to lead anybody else astray. I didn't want anybody else to have to be going through the, the horror that I was going through inside of my own heart. Mm-hmm. So I didn't talk to a lot of people about it. And I think that I really relate with that. So, you know, you in the in the book, you do talk about moral, moral failure and hypocrisy, and that can happen on all sides. Um, why do you think it's so vital, especially given our current cultural moment right now, to acknowledge that there is hypocrisy in the church, that there are um, a lot of, again, deconstruction stories, you go back into the history a little bit and there's a pastor who, you know, slept with the secretary or, or you know, youth pastor who was, it turns out, was abusing a lot of the kids in the youth group or something along those lines. Um, what's that? What's the role that we can play in acknowledging and why is that so important? And it is so scary when you think about how much of this we're seeing right now, in particular in the sexual moral failings. It just is astonishing to me, yeah. Lisa, when I look in the news and, uh, you know, and just the Christian leaders uh, that are happening. I mean, I just read yesterday about a pastor in North Carolina that got in a fight with the guy at McDonald's and tried to stick his head in the fryer. Wow. Uh, And I'm thinking, boy, that's not a good look. You know, the local pastor tried to drench the dude's head in, in the French fry fryer. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of instability right now, but Mm. I think God's exposing a lot right now. I really do. I think that he's exposing a lot of secrecy, a lot of darkness, a lot of sin. Uh, And it feels like the church at times, it looks like the church, you know, is it dying? But I think what we need to always remember is the true church of Jesus Christ isn't shrinking at all. It's expanding and growing. Uh, What's getting eliminated is a lot of false Uh, Christians that really just kind of become a sore for people to look at. Now, that's not to say that authentic believers don't mess up. Lord knows we do. But there's a difference between, you know, when you see some of the seek on just the long secrecy and 
cover up stuff. And there's, there, there's a lot of stuff of deception. It's really sad. I mean, on so many fronts, God has brought down so many leaders. Now I know someone could say, well, you had a relapse and I'd say, yeah, and I, I hate it. Uh, but my, I set out just to see if I could have a glass of wine or two, like a normal person and, and drink. And it actually snuck up on me. I didn't even, I didn't even intend to get inebriated when it happened. It just absolutely just climbed over me. And I thought, wow. And I was told when I was 21, when I got clean, that when you quit, uh, you might stay away from alcohol, but the, the, alcoholism if you if you pick up a drink someday it'll be like uh picking up where you would have been had you never stopped hmm. and um and and that was a scary thought for me to realize because the re, the the relapse that 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 one night was really hard i mean i was trying to manage stuff uh for about 6 months but i wasn't trying to like be i wasn't trying to be evil and go out and you know, hook up with women or right. I was actually trying to cope with a lot of, a lot of anxiety in my life. And, and, and we had things going on without going into detail, but there were just some, some trials that were going on with, with kiddos and stuff that, Oh, just the depression in our family was so bad mm -hmm. and it doesn't make it right. But I do think that there's a difference oh, yeah. between people who are just knowingly going out and sleeping with secretaries and, and going to prostitutes and yeah. then somebody on who's other people. trying to not, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then, but I, I, I hate that it happened, but what God can do is he's good enough that when we do have these moral failings in our life, he, he's so good that he can come along and he can even, you know, take the broken and turn it into beautiful and, yeah. and he can, and he can help us uh, with this. And I think as it relates to, you know, the whole, the whole situation with, with doubt, uh, there's just, there, there's such a level of, um, people's hypocrisy that some people just put their hope and stock and trust in people so much that when there is a scandal, then these people, you know, walk away. Well, if you, if you leave the church because of a scandal, well, you were never really following Jesus to begin with. We have to follow Jesus because moral uh, moral lapses will happen all the time. We see it replete in the scripture. We see it with leaders today. Uh, moral failings doesn't you know, mean Christianity isn't true. It just means Christianity makes the best sense for what to do with people when they right. morally mess up to look to the yeah. cross. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I just want to reiterate, too, there's, I think there's such a huge difference between what happened with you and then what we're seeing happen with some of these scandals. Because what typically, you know, I've had my dad on the podcast to talk about his alcoholism. And um, he had mm. a very similar um, long stretch of decades of sobriety and then relapsed. Um, now, I think that's been now like 30 years now, that second one. But he went through that as well. Um, but the difference between what happened with you and with my dad is that there's humility about it. There's, oh, my goodness, forgive me. There's confession. There's, you know, and, and not everyone confesses as quickly as you did, you know, within a week or two. But that's the point, though, is that you're saying, look, we're all sinners. And when we sin, the Bible says, confess. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. And, you know, there even could be greater degrees of sin that involve other people that would involve a lot of, um, you know, uh, maybe sabbatical with uh, restoration that could happen over years. But what we're seeing with the scandals is that you have these um, narcissistic pastors that are preying on other people yes. and everybody just covers it up for years and years and years and then gaslights the victims exactly. and you see all this stuff going on and that's a whole different category um, and and sometimes sadly those things can be conflated it's like oh well you relapsed with alcoholism so you're just like everybody else but aren't we all I mean my goodness and so I think that um, it's it's the cover-ups it's the continual patterns that never get dealt with and and when really because the bottom line is making sure you can keep every everything in place and the money coming in and all that stuff um so i think it's really good that you um talk about that in your book because we do see a lot of that um in the church right now and i think that really can cause people who wouldn't have otherwise fallen into an extreme thing of doubt to to fall into that um you also write about this group 
that um, don't identify with any religion. You know, you've heard people say, I'm spiritual but not religious. These are being called the nuns, not N-U-N like mm -hmm. uh, a nun in a convent, but nuns, N-O-N-E. <laughs> in other words, those who don't really hold a specific spiritual belief. Um, what's It's kind of this new demographic group. What's your take on that group? Yeah, I mean, what's really encouraging, at least, uh, is the new atheism that was kind of taking a lot of uh, media attention, writing a lot of books by, you know, the four horsemen. Yeah. Uh, you, and a lot of people were walking away from Christianity as a result of that. But I think we're seeing the bankruptcy uh, now of that entire movement. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we're still left with people searching for more. Now, people might not be ready to identify as Christian, but what this tells me is they're open to spirituality and Christianity obviously is a spiritual belief system. So it does give me hope. I think I would, it, it does seem like you're going to have a better chance of um, a conversation of relating on some things with the person who is at least open to, you know, spirituality. Uh, but then there are people sometimes that will fall into that category that just don't want to classify themselves in any way. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think after all the new atheism movement to see only what 5% still remaining atheists. Uh, so on that side, but the big news that we keep hearing about for the last three, four, five, six years is these nuns, those without a religious affiliation, but they still see themselves interested in spiritual and there's a lot of people that are around us that are like that. And they are often, you know, they don't want Christianity because of the moral uh, straight jacket that they mm -hmm. feel like they're going to be, you know, experiencing. And it's going to take some time because uh, we're living in a culture where people think that they've been freed up. Uh, you know, now they can express themselves, but the media, politics, uh, you know, the government, schools, they're, they're not telling us about the consequences. They're just mm -hmm. talking about the freedom that you're going to experience when you just sexually do whatever you want, when you just let go of everything. Uh, we're deconstructing ourselves <laughs> as, <laughs> as a country, and we don't even realize we're, or, or we're erecting our own gallows and we're going to hang from it soon. Mm. Uh, there's consequences. And one of the benefits of living the way that I did when I was a kid with the drugs, the alcohol, the promiscuity is I just don't buy it. When I hear about mm. how much fun people are having and stuff like that, I'm like, no. Yeah. You, you, I mean, and, and, and you think about this young generation, like, do you really want a man someday that just doesn't know how to say no to sexual impulse? Do you really want a person that you can't trust? Do you really want somebody that, um, you know, is just unfaithful to you that has no sense of, self-control in his life is that the kind of person you want because the way we talk that's what you're going to get just live without mm. you know any borders live without any boundaries yeah. people see christianity as something that they need to tear down because christianity is the oppressor and it oppresses people but far from that let's get god's eye on it there would never have been an std had we followed god's perspective think about yeah. that yeah i mean we would have trust. We wouldn't have That's guilt right. in our relationships from cheating on each other. We wouldn't be breaking down the family. We would have self-control. Uh, I think that's pretty. those are pretty good things that God has in store for us. That's great. That that you could get you, I could tell you got a little fire in your bones on that question. Oh that's man, good. yeah. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Toward I'm also hot in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Take the sweater off. yeah, there you go. Toward the end of the book, you so, you know, one thing we haven't really talked about in this episode is that you are a pastor. You pastor a church and you provide some pastoral words for churches um, who are wanting to love and encourage people who are struggling with doubt. So what is maybe one action step that Christians can take um, right now toward this goal of making the church a place that's more hospitable to doubters? Yeah, I think that we need to listen more. You know, I, I, I brought my pastoral team together and asked them to each share one word that they have in this year for people to think about, uh, that they can tack onto, that they would love to live out. And I wanted the pastors to say, 
a word that they would love to see materialize in our church. And the word that I had was listen. And I said, some of you guys just go out and you meet with somebody and you talk the whole time. I said, and then you leave thinking it was a great time, but the person's totally drained that just met with you because they just listened to you talk for an hour. You didn't ask any questions. I said, let's be the kind of church that listens to people's stories, that walks with people in their stories, that gets people to open up. I think that we have to let people know that it's okay to process your doubts with us in a church. But some churches can come across so rigid that people will be scared to bring it up. Mm -hmm. So what I do every week is I end my message and we have 20 minutes of live Q&A because I want people to ask questions. So I'm in the hot seat for 20 minutes. And I said, you can ask me questions about philosophy, history, your doubts, our culture, marriage, whatever it is. This is your time. And part of the reason for doing that is we're creating a culture that says it's okay for you to ask whatever's on your mind. And when somebody does bring somebody something up that would be church uncomfortable, call it, <laughs> I, I just celebrate that moment. And mm -hmm. I just look for that because we're trying to create a community that we belong. And I tell people all the time too, we need to realize everybody in our church has arrived through that door and we've been shaped by mentors, teachers, books, coaches, our pain, our traumas, our addictions. Uh, we've all been shaped differently. And to think that somebody could go to a one hour membership class and then we can check it off the list and think that they're just like us is mm -hmm. really naive. Yeah. The culture gets customization everywhere. We customize your order. We customize your cars. We customize your clothes, but the church, the, 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 the discipleship center called the church, we need to customize discipleship. We need to ask, instead of sending 30 or Christians who've been Christians for 30 years through basic Bible study methods for the 15th time, uh, we need to customize and figure out where people are at, hear their stories and, and, and work with them so we know what their wounds are, so we know what their doubts are, so we know where they need to grow theologically. So that is what true shepherding is. And I think when we shepherd the church in this kind of way, it will be a place where people will love to be amongst the herd. I'm so happy to hear you say that about, well, everything that you just said was great, but especially about the Q&A, because in our deconstruction book, that's exactly what we're telling churches. You've got to start doing a Q&A after your sermons, mm -hmm. because people need to know that it's okay to ask any question. And it's also okay right. to know that not every pastor knows every answer. And what a great opportunity, if you don't know the answer, to model the humility to say, you know what? I don't know. Come back next week and I'll have a better answer for you. Or, or you know, let's inv invite more discussion on that question. I think that um, I, I just hope that more pastors will follow uh, that example of what you're doing, because I think it's so crucial, especially right now, Bobby, when Everybody has access to social media and so many different opinions, many of which are just like, you know, in the deconstruction hashtag, like propaganda, outright prove demonstrably false information to be able to say, look, it's OK for you to bring all the questions you might have. I mean, it, it would be so naive to think that young people in your college group haven't seen a whole bunch of TikToks that week that are just dismantling Christianity. You need to be able to welcome that question like, hey, I saw this TikTok that right. made this claim. How do we process that? And I, I wonder if, you know, maybe many pastors are intimidated by that idea, but I would just encourage any pastor listening, don't be intimidated. Just try it. And it's okay to say you don't know. And then you can learn along with your congregation if it's something that you don't know the answer to, but at least you can process it together. So I'm so thrilled to hear you say that, Bobby. Well, as we come to the end of our discussion here, is there anything else you, you would like to let everybody know about the book? Is there um, any kind of pre-order or, or what can we be looking for in the coming weeks as we're approaching the release date of the book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the book releases April 24th. And so I'd love people to, you know, check it out. It, you, you can pre-order it uh, as of now, from what I understand. It's being published by Tyndale. I wrote it as kind of an intellectual biography. And so uh, I start the first part off where it's just a biography where, you know, 
I give people a story and the story's mine. And I just try to be vulnerable. I lay my heart out there. I share how I went from non-belief to belief, to questioning my belief, to belief again. And that's kind of that journey. And then I, I try to identify some of the you know biggest objections that people have in our culture today to Christianity. And then I keep trying to use a lot of story to carry people through. So they're fast moving chapters. Uh, they're short chapters. Uh, there's also a companion small group guide uh, that was created where my son, Dawson, who's a Gen Zer, and he's very articulate. Tyndale brought both of us up and we did a father son uh, small group series oh, for the local great. church. And we've designed it in such a way that people can learn how to start talking more openly and being honest. And we're just giving them these big questions. And then, Hey, they can talk. Have you ever struggled with this? And what does this look like? And I think to your point, if pastors won't be intimidated, they can even go through a book like this with their small groups. And then they can be teaching some of these points to their church. And then they can do some Q and a stuff on a broader scale. And they don't have to feel the pressure to answer all the questions. While I feel like this is part of my calling to do this, I still bring up teammates to do it with me. I, I, because I want to, sh- I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm, that I'm the only one that does it. And I think it's great to bring up, bring up some lay people that are well-equipped and let the body see that they can do it. Because if they just see us answering questions, well, that's what we get paid to do. That's what we're trained to do. So bring up some gifted lay people and celebrate what God has done in their life and you know, that I, honestly, I love watching other people succeed and seeing God use the gifts of other people in the church. Uh, that That's what makes it so much fun. And I don't want all the pressure of things falling on me because right. I, if I'm being honest with you, I sit there and go, man, I'm 50 right now. And I'm thinking, Lord, if I potentially live 30, 40 more years, how am I not going to jack this thing up again? Right. Like, like I get like somebody once says, what do you fear the most? And I said, well, outside of God, myself, I mean, mm. I, that, that I get overwhelmed. Like how many circumstances could go wrong? Like, Lord, please help me to never go into the dark night of the soul again. <laughs> Keep me out of there. So I'd ask my other request would be pray for me because uh, I'm just trying to figure this thing out one day at a time. And I want to help people that are hurting and I want to help doubters. And I just want people to know that I went out into the deep waters and I truly believe that Christianity still makes sense. And I think it makes the best sense of all the worldview options on offer. I love it. And I love that you've mentioned bringing up, uh, you know, support support staff on those Q&As because, you know, totally. Bobby, when we do apologetics events together and, you know, like cross-examine Instructor Academy, and those are some tough questions people ask. And in those moments when somebody brings up like the evolutionary paradigm as it relates to the bacterial flagellum <laughs> at the bottom of the marine layer, I'm really glad that Jay Warner Wallace and Greg Kokel are up there because I just look to them and I know they'll know, <laughs> they'll know, but I don't know that yeah. stuff. So that's great. Um, <laughs> where can people connect with you online, Bobby? Yeah, they can, uh, you know, subscribe at my YouTube channel, Christianity Still Makes Sense. The book's called Does Christianity Still Make Sense? But the YouTube channel and the podcast is called Christianity Still Makes Sense with Dr. Bobby Conway. So they can check those out and, you know, help us get the word out. Uh, You know, we want to help people like you do to stay in the Christian faith. Good. Well, I want to thank my guest, Bobby Conway. Be sure and pick up the book, Does Christianity Still Make Sense? A Former Skeptic Responds to Today's today's Toughest Objections to Christianity. And if you want help getting better training to help yourself be able to respond to some of these objections, check out Southern Evangelical Seminary, who's also a sponsor on the podcast. You can go to ses.edu slash Elisa, download a free ebook, see what SES has to offer. I've been a student, whether for credit or auditing, for uh, 10 years now at SES, and I'm so thankful for SES and all the great training I've had there. So check them out. And as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. We'll see you next time. 